Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ancient Warfare magazine podcast. In this episode, we're going to be thinking about military celebrity in the ancient world and how important was celebrity and perhaps was there any pitfalls to celebrity status? Joining me tonight is uh, regulars Yes Brotage, Murray Dam, Lindsay Powell, Mike Cole, Mark McCaffrey and Mark DeSantis. And also joining us as we record our patrons of the podcast. I send out a link just before we record so they can watch live and chip in any comments and questions as we go. If you're interested in becoming a patron, you can find out more at patreon.com slash ancient warfare podcast. So, Mike, uh, you put forward the idea. Why do you think ancient societies need military celebrities? So I start with Homer. Um, and I think I'm, I'm hoping Murray will uh, back me up here is that uh, <laughs> I, I, I start with Homer um, and I start with a line from Homer. Always be the bravest, my boy, always be the best. And that the um, base, the bedrock of the conception of of a great warrior in in um, archaic Greek culture uh, is likened unto the gods, right? Um, who is uh, personally touched the gods? Odysseus is, you know, uh, a beloved of Athena. You know, there is interaction between Ares and these demigods. Heracles himself is in the archaic conception, kind of a god, right? Um, and that bestows upon the avatar of military virtue in the ancient mind a uh, singular status that appends to the individual. Most people are not like this person, and this person, through their greatness, fathers our whole um, line with greatness. Um, you have the Spartans using the Heraclid legend uh, and the finding of Orestes' bones, which are really, you know, mammoth bones, probably, as this sort of way of of of, of invoking godlike lineage. And you see this throughout our archaic Greek um, uh, lineage myths. And this naturally lends itself to the idea of celebrity, right? It it appends to a single individual. It places this individual above others. And the whole conception of Arete and Andrea. These Greek words. I'm, I'm glad Murray is nodding. I was kind of terrified he, he wouldn't agree. I'm, I'm, I'm um, backing you 100. percent I'll, I'll, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, are, are around <laughs> this idea of, of of godlike status in the individual, yeah. and I really do think that that legacy continues all the way into the modern age, and we append it now to entertainers Absolutely. instead of warriors. But I really do think that that is a fundamental conception that that. Um, is a through line through human history beginning in the archaic period. Absolutely. I think I, I just wanted to bring up the, the hero's bones thing because there are several Greek cultures whose hero's bones are buried elsewhere and be brought back to their city. But uh, even when they found Che Guevara's body, uh, you know, not that long ago, this century, they took his bones back to, not to Argentina, where he's from, but back to Cuba. And there was a very, just a completely... Uh, parallel situation of the hero's bones have been returned to their natural place and it is it's appending it to the individual the individual's glory reflects upon their society and their um, their culture's glory it's remembered in poetry more than any other accomplishment you know yes artists philosophers poets are remembered but but warriors are remembered above all in, in ancient Greek even throughout the history of of history it has always been warriors and politics, but for a long, long time, really until the last 75 years, politicians have been warriors. Um, it's very, you know, those two things went hand in hand um, until we've lived in an age of, of less wars than, than previously. So you had me going there. I, I thought what you were saying that Che Guevara was somehow a subject of Homer and that must have been a lost volume somehow that I missed. <laughs> well, well... Well, there, you could easily, you could, you could, if you if you approached a, a Cuban poet, quite easily have a, a, a Castro Guevara uh, epic. <laughs> um, but I don't know that you know. I don't know that poetic epic is quite the genre yeah. it used to be in terms of popularity. Well, to develop to develop uh, Mike's point, you could argue, and then Virgil takes over the sort of franchise and invents the uh, the Aeneas story, uh, which is also about travails and the man taking on enormous odds. 
and being tempted and all those, and, and, and he becomes a hero in, in his own right. So it, it, it's a valid uh, theory. Well, yeah, and then into the and then into the medieval period with Roland and you know all of the um, medieval epics are all about great chivalric deeds by warriors. Um, you know, the all of the the Frossart chronicles are all about great knights. You know, and then we you keep going forward, and then you've got Napoleon, you've got Frederick the Great. Just yeah. It's a continuous line. It isn't the dictum of a good story that's uh, that's valid for novels as well as uh, for screenplays. Something like the hero needs something but has difficulty getting it, uh, and you know, fill in the blanks and lots of plot lines from that point on, and that sustains everything from Enkidu all the way through to you know uh, Lord Rings. What you're describing is called uh, the mono myth, and it's a it's a conception by Joseph Campbell in a famous book called A Hero with a Thousand Faces. I'm, I'm probably telling you something you already know. Um, but it, in that book, he argues that exactly what you described, Lindsay, is a common mm. trait to all mm. human myth, regardless of yep. culture. Lately, that, that theory has come under criticism. But when I was coming up in college and grad school, that was sort of the accepted truth. of yeah. uh, the, seven, the seven types of story that there's no other type of story than the, than the basic seven, um, which, is, which is always that an annoying kind of uh, thing to put in front of someone. You go, no, I'm going to write a story that's not one of the seven. And they write it and they're like, well, it's actually kind of a bit of three combined with five, isn't it? No! I'm yeah, I actually had genre. one which is called 101 plot lines, and I'm wondering what that would look like now, thinking of yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. do our military celebrities, military heroes, do they have to have a narrative? Do they have to have a story? Do they? Does their deeds need to be some sort of parable for people to emulate? You know, why, why are we putting these poor people forward as celebrities? Well, let me th throw this. I, I think that the issue comes down to it's, it's it's the man against overwhelming odds. So that the, the person that, that that I would advance as being an example from the Roman period would be Marcus Claudius Marcellus of two twenty two BC, who is one of the men that actually gets what are called spolia opima, which are the uh, that the rich spoils, and it's it's a great honor that the Roman commander seeks to slay his opponent and to strip his body of the armor to decorate this on an oak tree and to haul it back to Rome and put it in the temple of Jupiter to Ferretrius. And, and that is the, the greatest fame a Roman can have. And there's only like three people in the whole of Roman history, the first one starting with Romulus, uh, that ever attain this. And there are lots of people who try it, and then it becomes a subject of political machinations to ensure those people don't actually achieve it. But, but, but the story, the nugget of the story is, is that it's a force of 600 uh, Roman troops against 10,000 uh, Gauls. And through... Through a combination of um, luck and and just chance, which is luck, of course, uh, and, and thinking on his feet, uh, he's able to turn around what could be a total disaster into a situation where he's he's able to gain this stardom. And and even into the first century BC, they're minting coins with this with this figure of of, of of the man actually hauling this uh, spolia opima to the temple. So so even in the time of Augustus, this man was known. I think this is a different thing we're talking about, though, because you sort of started talking about the heroes and the the idea of you know the big bring back the bones and whatnot, and then moving on to celebrity of generals and politicians and whatnot, especially in the Roman era. I mean, on the one hand, the heroes are they're separated from the here and now by the ancients, and they you know they're put up there on a pedestal, untouchable. But when it comes to a Roman general who, you know, it might be someone uh, like a, a Scipio or, uh, you know, later on Caesar, uh, who, you know, they are put up there as having achieved great things, but they're not impregnable. They are there for the taking. And, it, you know, Scipio is a great example that he attains this height of fame and glory in a very early pe period of his life, but he goes on to nothing. He ends his life in, I wouldn't say disgrace, but he is he's sidelined because it's a poison chalice, this fame and uh, celebrity in the ancient world. Um, you can take, you know, Alcibiades ends up running for all of his life um, from one place to another because he attains a position in every place that he goes to of, you know, a superiority, but that just gets on everybody's goat. Well, that's why that's why I zero on in this particular this particularly uniquely oddly Roman thing, which is the rich sports, the spoli opimates, and yet three people in the whole Roman history do it, and their names become immortal because of that, and and people don't really care what happens afterwards because they have attained this unique stature, um, and um, it, 
that that's kind of one way of looking at it. I think it's it's a really interesting thing because you start with heroes who are indeed communing with gods, half you know half god, and then you get uh, semi mythical heroes like Solon and others who are we're not sure, but they are accepted as real mortals by the by the Greeks and by the Romans after them. You then get actual you know, physical, we can prove they exist because there's Ostraca with their names on them, heroes like Miltiades and others who are in later generations, they are indeed put on this pedestal, but they're kind of honoured in a way that is a direct line, you know, with the all of the stuff in the Iliad, with the um, the, tr the bronze tripods being given to them as spoils and, and honours, that continues on through, you know, the history of, of Delphi is full of those honours being given to warriors who we've now forgotten, who weren't in the ancient world, and we've remembering a, a fraction of the of the heroes who were honoured. Um, you know, Herodotus is full of these names of heroes who are names to us, but they've got a shrine at Delphi. They, you know, did this amazing thing, and if, if Herodotus doesn't mention them or another source, we're we're kind of they're anonymous to us. And then you get a continuation of all the Greek heroes, and so in many ways they have that hero heroism imposed upon them. They have a narrative imposed upon them. Um, which, as Mark was saying, that when they die in infamy, like a Marius or, or um, so many others, or a, a Hannibal, um, that kind of spoils the image. And that's in a way, I think, what Alexander avoids, because Alexander dies having not had that decline. So he's died at the height of his fame. And, you know, and the, the Solon um, definition of heroism is to die at the moment of your greatest glory. Um, you know, the, 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 the boys who die in the temple having carried their mother there, it's like, bam, they are, they're it. They, they, so let me, let, me, let me throw this into the mix. So, so maybe the, the, the metric here is, is, is name recognition. So looking at the definition of celebrity is the state of being well known. Um, and that he, heroism is, is, is a, a vector in it, is a dimension, I suppose, which gets you celebrity. But, but to, to Mike's original point is that that, that people were looking to military men to be these well-known individuals. And I think that's because it's a product of the societies where prowess as a warrior was valued more than an actor or a teacher or a politician, unless the politician was also a warrior. So, so that's where it's different than our times. I think, Murray, you made the point that now politicians aren't warrior people. And, and what's very interesting about our own society now is that uh, the people who uh, found themselves in government tend to be moderating influences against some of the civilians who might be more gun home using military force. But but really, you can count on one hand in the modern day, uh, at sort of if you like, celebrity warriors. It's not something that in our society we really want to promote. Well, it's interesting. You know what's happened recently with the memory of John McCain is is the counter to what what you would normally get as the the celebration of a military celebrity in in world history. Um, that that denigrating of a world history. And Vietnam is such an interesting parallel because it's an unpopular war. Um, there have been unpopular wars in, you know, Roman times. The Domitian's uh, Dacian campaign was an unpopular war um, and that gets forgotten, even though, you know, uh, so there are several of those in the ancient world as well. I think we're also very biased because we're ancient military historians. Um, but, you know, like we occasionally get evidence that the driver of the Greens was more famous than anyone else in his day. That a particular athlete at the Olympics, having won their third title, was more popular than anyone else. And we do have the same honorific structure that they get the statues, they get the inscriptions that warriors get. Um, you know, we get poets uh, in Athens, you know, Eupolis and uh, Aeschylus and, and all of these get the same honours that military warriors get for their poetry and their plays and their and their accomplishments. And even later, Keep in mind these poets, and 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 I mean Aeschylus, if I remember correctly, was on his Stella was he's memorialized for being a marathon of Machle. He's not memorialized for being a no. And of course, his brother, his brother loses his hand at marathon. Uh, Kynagiris, he's the one who gets his hand cut off, um, seizing hold of the ships, and that's remembered on the Stoa Poikile. Um, and I'll come back to the Stoa Poikile. Uh, the other, the other brother is Amenias, who's the most heroic. Athenian at the Battle of Salamis. So you've got Kynagiris, Amenias, and Aeschylus, uh, who are all famous as warriors. Aeschylus, famous as a poet, but says, I ran at Marathon on his, on his funeral stele. It's like, that's the, that's the important thing. There seems to have been a link between military celebrity and, and adventurism. That is, uh, Alcibiades has already been mentioned. But Pyrrhus, for example, uh, he made his name fighting against the Macedonians. 
and then was, because of the basis of that reputation, was invited by the Tarentines to come help them fight the Romans in 281. Then uh, 278, the Sicilians invite him to come and fight the Carthaginians for them. Uh, the Tarentines invite him back, uh, once again, because they know he's a fine general. He goes back in 275 to fight the Romans again, uh, doesn't have as much success. Then uh, he uh, winds up being invited by the king of Sparta to help him. And then there's the Argos is finally, and someone in Argos invites him. So as he had was a military celebrity in, I think, the truest sense that he was famous for being an excellent general, uh, and uh, he kept on getting essentially hired to come fight for whatever reason, wherever he was. Uh, you make an interesting point, actually, because there's that sort of just highlights the amount of information that's being passed back and forth. If you think about, on the one hand, Paris's reputation, bouncing back and forth across the Mediterranean. I would think of Sertorius in Spain as he's uh, you know, launching his name in Spain. That gets all the way across to Mithridates, who all of a sudden decides, well, I've, I'm hearing such great things about this guy. I'll go across, I'll you know, make some, uh, you know, sound him out and see if I can do a deal with him. Um, Alcibiades that is, as well. That is correct. That is correct. And in fact, uh, the, the Xanthippus, the uh, mercenary, Spartan mercenary general who was hired by the Carthaginians to fight the Romans in the uh, First Punic War, the, he may be the same Xanthippus that was later uh, uh, employed by uh, King Ptolemy of Egypt uh, uh, on the basis of that reputation that he established as a uh, who defeated by the, the Romans. To, to bring it back to um, less well-known, you've got that idea of the Spartan drill master, which Xanthippus is a great example of, that they're Spartans, sorry, Mike, that they're Spartans, they're hired by the rest of the world to be the trainers of their of their warriors because he's Spartan. He must he must know something because he's from Sparta. You know, in Sparta, the Peloponnese be becomes the mercenary capital of the, of the fourth century. So there's all these, you know, non-Spartans hanging out in the Peloponnese to be hired as mercenaries, almost by geographic. Well, you're in Sparta, you must be, you must be good. So the celebrity um, is actually the state, the city they come from rather than them as an individual, it sounds like. I think, I think it's, I think it's both. I think it's, you have, you have Caesar's legionaries who are amazing because they're Caesar's legionaries and their own accomplishments. You have the, the, the individual themselves and their lieutenants who are you served under? I mean, you know, the entire Diadochoi story is these are the the commanders of, of Alexander. They must have got some of Alexander's magic, and they all try and emulate Alexander's magic. You know that 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 model of Alexandrian um, generalship. You must lead your cavalry from the front. You've got to be front and center. You can't be at the back commanding. You've got to be at the front leading. Plutarch noted that uh, Paris, unlike the other. Uh, generals who tried to emulate Alexander, he he was the real deal. That is, uh, the other generals they would wear a scarlet cloak, they would hold their his head at uh, an angle, just as Alexander did. They would go uh, around with the bodyguard, but uh, Paris actually knew how to fight. And I think that's again to the to the point of hero. Sorry, Mike, the point of heroism. It's about emulation that we are emulating our heroes. We and so that's that link between the distance of an of a figure of myth as opposed to a real general who we put on a pedestal, I can copy and be that general if I'm associated with them, if I look like them. You know, uh, Pompey and his blonde hair. Pompey finds the cloak of Alexander in Alexandria, wears it in his triumph, conquers on three continents. I am the great, just like Alexander, which every other general's tried to do. You know, I've conquered on, you know, it's amazing how generals still try and emulate. When Schwarzkopf did um, the invasion of... Uh, of Kuwait, he was. I'm going to emulate the Battle of Kanai. You know, he he gave away his battle plan. Well, um, Schwarzkopf's interesting because he is a, a, a latter day military hero, but his name is attached to a campaign almost as if it was trying to sell it. And I wonder if uh, we see that in the ancient world. You'll get some. You'll get somebody, be it a unit or a general, attach it to your army, and could that then uh, give you an edge? Well, probably, because the alternative, you end up with someone like Patton, who becomes a somewhat caricature, and he uses this in all his campaigns. Um, so, so I think inevitably your success is, is, is on, based on your last good game. Hey, before we, before we move on too far, I want to note two things that both of the Marks said. Um, so Mark brought up, Mark with a K brought up um, <laughs> the deaths of, uh, or the, the slide into ubiquity of 
Scipio Africanus, and who was the other one, Mark? Um, you saw, oh, Alcibiades. Hmm. And then Mark with a C brought up Pyrrhus, who dies at Argos, brained with a roof tile, right, by an old lady. Which, and you see these patterns in the sources that describe this celebrity arc the same way again and again and again. And we know that ancient sources don't have the same standards of objectivity that modern historians do. And I start to see a theme that we see in ancient Greek myth of hubris and nemesis, right? Icarus, you 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 rise as high as the god, and then you invoke Nemesis, and she lays you low. Um, and that story arc that both of the marks brought up seems to be a common theme in ancient celebrity. I just and and so much so that I almost wonder if ancient historians were kind of playing to that uh, cultural tick. Well, I think I think Plutarch Plutarch's probably the main culprit in that that moral imposition of a story, even if the reality of their life doesn't fit it, he'll make it fit it. Um, and I think that that's very true, that, that the imposition of a story, of, the, of a heroic story, is something that happens in our stories, even if it's not really true. Like when you look at the story of Alcibiades, uh, the things that thwart him, the hubris moments, are, they're kind of minor, you know, someone someone disfigured, well, well they're, they 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 might not be they might not be they they I think that's again one of those problems of we don't necessarily understand the culture that there's a bit of graffiti on the 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 statues he gets blamed but it's kind of looks like a stitch up it's like well it's not proven and yet his him running away almost and you know he he sort of proves his guilt by fleeing rather than answering the question why does he seduced which Spartan king yeah yeah <laughs> well yes that's not going to help but you know. Yeah, not not some not some random anonymous Spartan wife. It's got to be the wife of the king. Um, yeah. So if there is a story arc to these uh, to, to, to celebrity life, is there a purpose behind it? Are they are they like parables? Then are we just remembering choice bits that make the story? Well, remember, as I said, that the, the art of a good story it has these. The, someone said seven plot lines. And there are things that work and resonate with people, and they're easier to remember too. If you come up with all these elaborate plots, nobody can remember that. But uh, but the, but the ultimate, the hero who becomes a tragic figure, um, pulls at you in, in in a different way, and that's why I think to go slightly for someone, but uh, uh, understand this, yeah, Jean Luc Picard in, in Star Trek: The Next Generation, I think is at his heart a tragic figure, um, and I think they're going to play on that in the new series. What you mean the the the, the 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 Shakespearean actor who ended up on Star Trek? Who um, <laughs> <that's, laughs> no, did extremely wait, wait, well. Wait, that's the, the the Patrick the Patrick the Patrick Stewart slash Jean Luc Picard arc. Yeah, but actors. I don't think anybody actually likes very much a sort of hero who's just this bombastic, bloated. I'm cleverer than you, and I win at everything I'm, I do. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna double down on James T. Kirk there. Uh, okay. <laughs> but I think that, um, well, he's just a buffoon character. No, no. Um, <laughs> I think I think it's a, it's a really interesting one. I think the other thing, of course, that we we have is a, a an overview of ancient history, and we have this kind of connection, which may not have been conscious. I think the other thing that's interesting is that a lot of military celebrities are local. That when you look at Greek. Um, city states. When you look at the surviving archaeological record, you will find a military celebrity in a city who's not a military celebrity anywhere else. Um, and in the literary world, you have the memories of of military celebrities coming through. Several of whom, to us, are more obscure than others. Um, you know, we have the great individuals, but then you'll have these smaller individuals who are um, like Sertorius. You know, Sertorius. Is, is upheld as, a, as an example of, of military brilliance. Iphicrates also, um, and several others who are lesser because they don't fight the big wars, they don't fight the big enemies. Um, you know, uh, in Mutina, uh, in one of the Periochi of, of Livy, there's a story about, there's a, a monument to the memory of Marius having defeated the Cimbri, and it's a shrine that is still being... Uh, honoured and kept up in 42 BC. And you're like, well, that's 60 years after Marius's victory against the Cimbri at, in, the, in the vicinity of that town. He's still honoured, remembered, and people regard Marius as a military celebrity there, even though, again, in that arc, he's, he has the downturn and he ends in infamy and sort of nullifies all of the glory that he achieved. And yet, in that town of Mutina, he's still a military celebrity, even though 
everywhere else in Italy, he might not be remembered uh, as a celebrity. You know, Sulla's done his best to erase the memory of Marius. Cicero likes him, um, and obviously Caesar, as his nephew, has sort of revived the memory of him. But in the town of Mutina, he is a military celebrity through and through, and you can't take anything away from him. And I think various city-states in the Greek and, and Roman worlds have that military celebrity attached to them, and that comes back to that idea that the military celebrity is tied to their locale because they did a great deed in our city streets. So uh, I, maybe I, I should know this, and I don't. Shame on me. So Mutina, it, does it have a a son of dimension to this? I mean, the fact was he born there, or was he an honorary citizen of, or something? He's from Arpinum. He's from the same. Um, Cicero okay. loves him because they come from the same hometown, the okay. same hometown. No, no, Mutina is is it's in the locale of the the Battle of Vercelli. So it's kind of his great deed was done here. Therefore. And you still, we still have that today. That you know, our 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 honouring of military sites. You know, the people that go to Thermopylae as if it's a, a a pilgrimage. The people who go to these battle sites are probably more and more modern battle sites. You know, Gettysburg gets um, pilgrimages, um, even the Battle of Hastings and things like that. Building an abbey on the battlefield of of, of Hastings, for instance, is part of that celebrity. And then, in a weird way, with the Christian. Um, medieval period and even the late Roman period, that idea that you bring it back to religion, that these great military heroes have been the instrument of God, is very similar to going back to Homer and saying these great military heroes are the instruments of the gods. Um, it's, a, it's, it's all tied together and, and um, remarkably similar how we honour celebrities. Now, we're in a phase now where, where we, we honour military celebrities less. Um, there's a there's a really interesting factor of honouring servicemen more, the anonymous servicemen, the diggers of World War One for Australia, the servicemen of America, um, you know that honouring everyone who served as opposed to that amazing guy who won the Medal of Honour twice. We now we now honour the whole lot. Uh, uh, just to be to be, bring it back to the ancient world and to Angus's question, um, military uh, celebrity and what it means. Uh, so Angus, I was going to posit that. Military celebrity in the ancient world is, it's an expression of cultural values. It's saying that this is what we as a culture value embodied in this person in the same way that I would argue that the early Christians may have expressed Christ, you know, what is a Christian? Look at Christ. This is what a Christian does or, or, or behave. Um, and, uh, th and the point, the source I want to use to support that theory is, uh, I, I mentioned this already with the hubris nemesis cycle, but I keep seeing patterns in lives of military celebrities in the same period. Uh, one example I gave in the email was the lives of, um, and I'm sure Lindsay will uh, dive in here, uh, Lucius Aemilius Paulus Macedonicus and uh, Titus Quinctius Flamininus and um, Hippio Africanus. All three of them have these incredibly similar stories where they're young, they violate the cursus honorum, they don't want to be consul, they're made consul by public acclaim, and the similarities are so, and then when they have power, they tell the public to get out of the way and let us do it, and the public does, and the results are good. But these similarities strike me, not just in Plutarch, but in Diodorus, um, uh, in, uh, I'm drawing a blank, of course, now, because I'm nervous, but the, the, um, <laughs> they're, so similar, they're so similar that mm. I think, that a story is being told. There's an expectation here. But there's a comment being made on the society at the time that the idea that they've gone through the, the period of the Punic Wars, there's been a massive drain on the population in terms of the political uh, talent out there, the a drain on the the older heads of the Senate who could usually be um, you know drawn upon to you know keep everybody in line, and that what's being said is that this new generation is coming through, gaining this great status, great, gaining this celebrity, um, having the talent because they've actually you know been gone through a better training regime than you know most other generations of Roman uh, legionaries. But on the other hand, uh, that once they've attained this uh, celebrity and this status, they're not being tutored in the right way because there's nobody there to tutor them for an older generation as to what happens next. And I think that's the narrative that you're getting in these sources. 
I, I wonder if you I wonder if you separate celebrity and status if if status is in the now and celebrity is actually after the event. So you know how how, how much of a celebrity was somebody at that time. There's a good example. Can I give a good example there? The story there? arc. <laughs> There's it, going against everything that you've sort of been saying about the story arc thing. The one that keeps coming to mind for me is Craterus, in terms of in Alexander's army. He is the guy that yes, he, he represents the cultural identity of the Macedonians more than anybody else. He's the one who goes out there in his typical Macedonian hat, but he refuses to wear the ba- the, the helmet on the battlefield because he wants to be sh- seen there in his traditional you know, outfit but at the same time he is the man's man throughout the army he stands up against alexander for anything that is not macedonian and whatnot and he ends up going out on a high because he is the guy that when it comes to get to the period of the successes everybody is you know he doesn't even have to be there at, the, at um, you know babylon when the the uh, decision is made in terms of who gets what positions next Everybody is talking about what about Craterus? What you know, he's got this reputation that exceeds everything, and even when he dies, um, the idea that he has been killed um, it turns you know that it turns into the greatest crime that could be committed in the Hellenistic world because that was the guy everybody doesn't didn't matter which side you were on in terms of the first war of the successes, Craterus dying goes beyond anything that's like a cultural crime yeah and i mean, I mean you know he, he commands the left flank of the phalanx he commands the left division of the phalanx in every one of alexander's battles and uh, <laughs> a point i make in my book um but I, and i think it's true it's and he, he is the status he is the he is the phalanx he represents everything that a macedonian phalangite stands for and i think that that's similar you do get you know when Ale- when scipio africana stands up to answer the, the the charges brought against him, he simply says, "Look at me." So I think there are there are examples of individuals within the ancient world who use their status as heroes whilst they are living, um, and that that they you know they walk around like celebrities. And I think um, coming back to that arc, the same thing happens with Marius. He stands up for his first consulship, even though he's outside the cursus honorum, and says, "None of these noble generals in the latter part of the." second century are any good vote for me same with pompey the same with crassus um, i'm the richest man i'm buying the election and now i'm going to go and fight a war in parthia um celebrity campaigns that caesar plans a campaign in parthia to avenge crassus's death he dies before he can fulfill it therefore uh, you know mark antony goes on the parthian campaign which if he'd succeeded against octavian would have had much more publicity but because we've got the split in the roman empire at that point in time everyone thought it forgets about uh mark antony's parthian campaign and augustus then is like well i'm going to go and get it and of course the prima porta celebrates the fact that he was able to achieve the the recovery of the roman standards that no one else was able to achieve so there's sort of a a celebrity campaigning in that regard the same with dacia you know you get domitian and dacia then you get trajan and dacia um so there's sort of a let's campaign there there's parthian wars throughout um the roman empire all the time there are parthian campaigns and it's again harking back to alexander conquered the parthians slash persians therefore i can too um so i think there is that that part of the celebrity status thing too of, of emulation and and look at me i'm i'm alexander the great which just is uh, continuous. May I, may I, may I take, a, take a thread from your very interesting argument? Um, the, the interesting thing, you were talking about Cleopatra, Mark Antony, Octavian, Blaise becoming Augustus. I, I think things begin to change when, when Augustus begins to control who can be called a celebrity and who cannot be called a celebrity. And effectively, the way that it was communicated to the public was through the imperator, uh, the imperatorial acclamations. So he begins to basically, whenever the troops acclaim the, the general, he says, no, 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 that's mine. So by the end of his reign, he has 21 of these things, even though they've all been won by various other generals. Um, and I think then what happens is his successes emulate this. They mimic this. So it's very hard to be a celebrity commander after Augustus because he doesn't want you to be one. In fact, to go back to my Spodio Opima thing, um, the king is Crassus, who was the only other person who really could claim to have actually got the spotty opium, but was actually basically denied it. 
and it was for political reasons that Augustus couldn't afford to have another guy that actually could have been more important in terms of actually having achieved this very rare honour. Um, and it then expresses its way in terms of who is allowed to have triumphs. He actually creates the ovation as a, as a sort of second-hand uh, a downgraded version so that, okay, I'll let the generals have their moment in the sun. Uh, they can have a parade, but it's not going to be the ticker tape one because I had the best one, but I had my triple triumph. Can I, can I just jump in there and just ask, I might be getting this wrong, but isn't Crassus, uh, Crassus Jr. allowed to have uh, Spolia, but because of the fame of his father? No, he's Am denied it. He's not allowed oh, to have it. He's given it? a triumph. He's actually given a triumph and he's actually, it becomes a whole political mess because people say, oh, well, we know why you're doing that, but of course nobody will actually utter those words in public. But, but no, he's actually denied it. And, and, and the, the deal is this, is that just a year or two before, and I think we're talking around about, correct me if I'm wrong, about 26 BC, something like that. Um, he had made a deal with uh, Jupiter Ferretrius to tidy up and clean up the temple. And he was shocked when he gets to see this temple, the roof is leaking and he's seeing the, uh, the old uh, armor, for example, of um, Marcellus. And he actually just said, this is terrible. I mean, how, how can this be in this time? I'll make a pact with you, Jupiter. You know, you make me the guy who actually gets the, uh, the spot and I, I will re restore your temple. Um, so in fact, that's partly the reason why they bring this other man back it, it, through the coinage rather than allow a newcomer because the newcomer could be threatening to this really immature regime. And, and the point is, after that, nobody else is allowed to have them. Uh, the, the guy I wrote about, uh, Claudius uh, Drusus, the, uh, the, the Drusus the Elder, came very, very close to getting one, but didn't get one. For what we yeah. And it's interesting that uh, with later emperors, especially Ty, you look at Nero and Domitian, it's not just that the general can't be uh, honoured as a celebrity, it's that the generals are like, don't honour me as a celebrity because it'll get me in trouble. When you look at Domitius Corbulo, uh, when you look at Agricola, when you look at several other, I mean, even even the year of the four emperors, you're looking at Vespasian, you know, who's who's doing great work um, for the emperor, and it's like, well, I, I'm going to get I'm going to get assassinated, just like Corbulo, who had to fall on his sword. I've got to, you know, make my move, um, and that that sort of positioning of of I think there are several military celebrities that under any other regime would have been military celebrities in the Roman Empire, they are denied it, but they deny it themselves. And it's a really interesting thing that, that Mike brought up about the humility of him, of um, military heroes in, in the history of heroism, that, you know, the, the, the model we have is of uh, someone who goes back to work after they've you know, they, they are a military hero, they do great deeds, then they go back to the farm. And you get that in the Roman Republic, you get that in the Greek uh, city-states, you get that in, you know, throughout the military history. They've done the job, now they've gone back to life. And it's really interesting when you look at, for instance, the history of the, the Victoria Cross, it's the same model. You don't get the, the egotistical, I want a military honour, um, the, the only time it happens with the Victoria Cross is when they give away the first um, the first civilian military uh, Victoria Cross during the um, Indian Mutiny, which goes to a guy named Kavanagh. He writes a book, How I Won the Victoria Cross, and it's like he's shunned by society because like, you don't do that. You don't you don't talk up how you got this award for valor, you know, and I think it's, 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 it's a funny thing because that idea, when I write about the Victoria Cross, it's like winning the war, the Victoria Cross feels wrong. So I, I have to kind of come up with ways to say recipient, um, you know, that rather than, rather than winning it, it's not a competition. Um, and I think that, you know, as Mike said, all of the winners of these medals talk about the fact that they were, uh, it's, it goes to their comrades, especially those who didn't, didn't live. It goes to their commanding officers. It goes to the entire integrity of the army, the unit, the, the company, the battalion that allowed them to be in the position to, to uh, be honoured with that award. And so therefore, they re they accept it on behalf of all of their other comrades. And that's a remarkably uh, honorific thing to do. And yet, weirdly, we see that now mirrored in the sporting world. Whenever, you know, you get a celebrity and we've replaced, I think, our military celebrities with sporting and cultural celebrities. I was going to throw this in, in for the discussion, which is uh, you, you, you talked about that. You were hinting at a sense there's there's a there's a dimension which is um, the, the Latin word that occurs to me is uh, moderatio, which is this 
the, the, the lack of being out there and claiming something in your chest. And what it, it reminded me, for example, when you were talking about how uh, people would sort of shun things and, uh, and turn away honours. I was thinking of Marcus Agrippa, who famously turned down two triumphs. And I wonder, in a sense, whether he'd either discussed this with Augustus before or he, in a sense, set the trend for the future is, you're the governor, I'm not going to take any way of the limelight from you, I will defer to actually decline my, my triumph. And, and at that point, then, really, from that point on, they really only go to the members of his family. Politically, it was very troublesome for anyone not of you know, uh, Augustus's family to have a, to be allowed a triumph because that created a potentially political power base uh, that was not part of his family. And instead, he would uh, give out the, uh, uh, the, I think they were called the triumphal ornamentalia. Essentially, there were medals in lieu of the actual triumph. My point is to extend Mike's point, which is, I think to some degree, depending on the period you're in, celebrity is manufactured or managed. So you could say, for example, during the heyday of the Roman Republic, where there were free and fair elections and things like that, um, you know, that, that the man could actually do what he do, did and go back to his fellow countrymen and be recognized as that. Not so under the empire, because the regime could not have that kind of rip-roaring, rollicking... Um, type of celebrity figure, because there's only one celebrity, really, in the news. And Tacitus is actually a good example of try, like a kickback against that in terms of trying to actually bring forth Agricola as a, as a celebrity, build up the celebrity as like a private rebellion against it, having you know, seen what has happened to Agricola being you know, put down and such. Yeah, in a sense, his subtext is, is that we were great because we had the ability to make heroes and celebrities, and we can't do that now. But also, I'm writing at a time where it's safe to talk about this as opposed to in the previous regime, which was a tyranny. Um, and I think, I mean, the other thing I was wanting to bring up was the um, the rarity in, in the ancient world, even though it does exist. Um, you know, you've got uh, Sceva in Caesar's commentaries where he chooses a lower ranking soldier as uh, a celebrity. And I think, you know, again, with the um, the Falera that that, that um, Romans wore, and even the, the some of the crowns, there are ways of recognizing not just the generals but individual soldiers. And you know, I think the same thing applies. If that centurion who has those Falera and those uh, is attached to your legion, your century, you are you are a celebrity through association because that's your command officer. Let, let me ask this because it has been asked, and we've got one of our one of our uh, 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 patrons ask something along the similar lines. And we've got a question from uh, Rudolph as well. So, you know, um, what's more important when it comes to celebrity? Is it bravery? Uh, is it skill in arms and tax? It could, could it be that the guy's just a brilliant, you know, logistics and, and uh, gets the job done in, in that respect? Is, is there a formula for what you need to be to be a, a, a military celebrity? Is it, is it all down to valour on the battlefield or... Could it be other things? I would say there has to be some element of success. I think that, that Pyrrhus would not have been invited again and again to fight on behalf of various people if he kept on losing. The, the, the battles that he fought against the Romans were victories, and we know them as Pyrrhic victories because they were so costly, but they were victories. Another one like that, and it'll be the end of me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But are they, are they, is he there at the front? You know, is it his individual bravery, or is he a celebrity because he's... He's 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 part of the command team. He, he's the the name. Pyrrhus might be not the best example because he it's literally all his personal valor. There's just story mm. after story. first over the walls. That I can't remember the name of that Sicilian city. There's descriptions of him cutting a guy almost in half when his son is killed. Mm. There's so much description of Pyrrhus individually mm. fighting. Um, it's, so it's, it's a bad example if we're looking for cases where things other than personal bravery and valor are lionized. I think it's also, you've got to be in the right place. You've got to do the right thing according to the culture. Um, you know, when you look at, again, going back to Greek, uh, Homeric, and then later poetry, it's all about stand facing your enemy, face their blows, face their spear thrusts, you know, don't take a step backwards. Um, when you get Archilochus or another poet, to say I threw my shield away. It doesn't matter. I can get another one, um, which is you know repeated by by Horace. Um, that's kind of anathema to the to the tradition, which is great because it says well there are other people who are far more mercenary than we 
are led to believe, but they're all shunned for how dare you say that. You know, there's a story that Archilochus is thrown out of, of um, the Peloponnese for daring to write a poem about a lack of military valour. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's a whole combination of things. It's in the right spot at the right time. It's having other people see what you do and be able to record it. Um, it's, you know, valour. And, you know, that brings up the whole Caesar commentaries thing. Well, he's writing his own story. There's a lot of propaganda going around as well. I mean, if you take take Cicero, for example, Cicero does his whole propaganda spin on the Catiline conspiracy. And in the end, you know, the, what's, the, what's the final moment of that? He's got, you know, Sallust writing it up that Catiline in the final battle is found facing his enemies he's got every wound in the front he's made out to be this he's made out to be the great famous celebrity enemy so that cicero can come across as a famous celebrity victor so yeah and you know and cicero cicero wants a triumph after his uh, his campaigns in parthia which no one even really rates you know it's like sorry what oh did you even do anything um and i think there's that kind of yeah it's a very touting their own horn as opposed to you know, Cicero is a great example, as as is Caesar, of blowing their own trumpet for their own accomplishments. Whereas, uh, an or a, you can take Lucullus, is it Lucullus sitting outside the gates of Rome after coming back from Mithridates' campaign? You know, he sits out there for months and whatnot, trying to drum up the, his own fame. Even in the Spartacus campaign, you know, the fact that they're fighting ex-slaves, like no one's going to pay any attention to that. But they want to defeat it and you know try and get the glory before. Uh, Pompey comes back and mops them up. Um, you know that 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 sort of like no, I want I want the victory. It's my victory. You know, like the, you know, it's it's such a strange thing. And I think there is a um, with the the tradition of the scholarship when it comes to uh, what becomes imperial cult, the the transition from Greek hero worship through Republican hero worship, which becomes this idea of how do I honor the Roman emperor? Um, that there's a sort of trajectory of climax that when you get 15 days of supplicatio no no 20 days of supplicatio no no 25 days so there's this absolute we need to honor the victories of sulla more than we honored the victories of marius we need to honor the victories of caesar more than we honored the victories of sulla of, of sulla so there's a sort of uh, my victory is more important than your victory because i'm alive and, and, and you need to honor me and more. to that exact point uh, in, in the uh, Augustan Forum in, in Rome there, in fact, the uh, Weary Triumphales, who were basically something like 30-odd individuals who were triumphant generals and commanders, who were actually put up in the forum with their cult, cult life history. And the idea was that these were people that uh, the young generation would emulate. So uh, that this is part of the controlling the story of, you know, what is what is acceptable and what is not. You, you will be forgotten. You will have damnatio memoria, effectively, if you are not remembered. One of our pet Brian, one of our patrons, come, came came up with a uh, a question which is possibly along something along these themes. Um, he points out Alexander failed to secure a lasting stable dynasty, uh, yet he was emulated uh, from the Hellenistic to Roman periods. Um, so was it all about winning battles that counts? Uh, was legacy of uh, a lesser importance? But that's just like today that. We all make it out of, of celebrities what we want. And I think that's, you know, throughout from the Hellenistic to the Roman period and beyond, the idea of what, why people remembered and, you know, thought of Alexander as the great one to emulate. They, you know, they're doing it for other, for lots of different reasons from a successor's point of view, saying, I'm going to be the next great conquering, you know, like Pyrrhus comes through and says, I'm going to be the Alexander in the East. But, you know, then you get uh, Pompey, I think, yeah, Pompey turning up in Alexandria and saying, right, I want to see a king, as if, you know, uh, none of the rest count. That's what I'm got, that's what I want to see him for. That's why I consider him. Um, you know, everybody's got their different idea. I think Alexander is a perfect example of the point I made originally, is that Alexander is almost deified. In fact, he is deified mm -hmm. in the and in other <laughs> Literally, uh, yeah. The empire, right. Um, and, he, and he sort of occupies this Heraclean-like uh, semi-deific uh, status. There's a, a wonderful book by James Rahm, a professor of Bard called Ghost on the Throne, mm -hmm. which talks about the wars of the Diadochi. It's probably my favorite one of those, dividing the world together. 
one of the things that Ron talked about is how Alexander's ghost hangs over proceedings and how the possession of his body becomes important. There you go. Love that book. Love that book. James Ron is such a great post stylist as well as a scholar. Um, but the point uh, I think to make to the patron is that um, is that legacy is that winning battles. Look, there's lots of commanders who've won battles and that don't have the kind of impact that Alexander did. And what's also fascinating about Alexander is that he essentially doesn't have a family legacy in terms of founding agents and having children uh, that that succeed him uh, in a famous dynasty the way the Scipiones do or the Amelie do. Uh, on the Roman side. Um, so I really do think that it's a very strong argument made for this kind of semi deified legacy. And you see the Romans consciously constructing it in the cult of the divine emperors later on. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar, the stories of his birth, you know, that it was a snake and it was therefore divine. And even, you know, Alfred the Great got a lineage back to Odin on one side and Adam on the other uh, as a way of constructing that 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 you are connected. So it, again, back to your original point about the Homeric heroes and their connection with the gods. That continues, um, you know. Uh, and, and we still we we still talk about God given talents, even in our soldiers, you know, as opposed to training, uh, learning, reading, experience. Uh, you know, it's no no no. Everything you do, it's God given gifts. You're like, well, no. There was a lot of personal work that went into it. Um, so it's it's a really so, so here's a counter to the uh, Alexander the Great hero, which is this one, which is Alexander the Great failure, uh, which I which I think is a, is a marvelous title, it, and that subtitle is called the Collapse of the Macedonian Empire. And who's that, that by Lindsay? That's by John D. Granger. Um, yeah, so so the basic one, is it? Uh, this was about five six years ago. Uh, but the point is here. But for all his military prowess and success as a conqueror, John Granger argues that he was one of history's great failures. Alexander's arrogance was largely responsible for his own premature death, and he was personally culpable for the failure of his imperial enterprise. So, you know, I, I think that's the part that got, kind of gets glossed out of the, uh, of the legend telling, um, that, that it worked for his successors. And I think you, you point out people squabbled over who would have the body because it's kind of divine. Um, and, and I understand all that. And ironically, therefore, all of the the most important sources we have about his life are ones which are written about 200 years and more after, are they not? So so there's already myth-making in the process of that. But it's also, and it's it's again going back to other celebrity, military celebrities, what are they expected to be? And coming back to this idea of the arc, that they never achieve what we expect them to achieve. And Alexander's a great example that, you know, he had a family, he had a legacy, they got assassinated by his squabbling successors. So it's like, well, you can't blame Alexander for that, nor can you blame Alexander for drinking heavily and dying of a fever. You know, that's not his fault. And yet, in this cult of celebrity, yes, it is your fault. Epaminondas, you've destroyed the Spartans at Leuctra and Mantinea. How dare you die on the battlefield and not have a succession plan to make Thebes replace Sparta as the ruling city of Greece. It's like, well, maybe that wasn't part of the plan. Maybe destroying the, the hegemony of Sparta was the plan. He didn't need Thebes to take Sparta's place. But that's like, no, you, you're, you've created a power vacuum. You didn't fill that power vacuum. You fail. And it's like, wow, hang on. Where did that pressure come from? And again, that does start very early. Um, and Alexander, you know, the whole brotherhood of man, the stoicism and all of that connection, it is very early in the sources that he his legacy is created. But from a, a military perspective, the legacy he leads is that very much lead where I follow rather than do as I say. And it takes a it takes centuries for that model to change. We, 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 we're com coming to the end of our hour, really, but. We're, 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 we did have uh, Abraham, one of our patrons, put, said, you know, how did dying in an ignoble way affect one's legacy as a war hero? Well, in, in Ale Alexander's case, it, it seemingly didn't really affect his uh, le his uh, legacy as a war hero. <laughs> Not Pyrrhus either, man. Pyrrhus got clocked by an old lady with a roof yeah. top, dragged into an <laughs> after And we remember him as one of the great leaders, you know, like it's, it, yeah. it really does diminish well, the legacy. Most of the people we've mentioned tonight have actually been killed in horrible ways. You get Sator Sartorius has got an assassination that he sees coming and ain't going to do nothing about. Crashes with the with a gold poured down his throat. I think Paulus is interesting because, you know, having been defeated at um, at, at Tresamine, he dies 
the way he should. He dies where he can't fall over because he's pierced by spears. That, you know, oh, you kind of be like, oh, what a good, oh, what a good way to go. Oh, 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 oh. As opposed to you led, you led an entire Roman army into an ambush that using scouts would have told you, don't go there. And yet you, you know, so there, there is a kind of a personal valor way of escaping a bad military reputation if you die well. Um, you know, a great life and a, a good life and a great death, which is a Victorian um, kind of epithet. But it's very true for many ancient military figures that if you die well in accordance to these uh, precepts of what a good death looks like, facing the front, facing your enemies, doing what a good soldier should, you can pretty much wipe away uh, any kind of uh, stain that you've had. Um, and that's that's such a, an interesting image that we get throughout ancient history. Well, well, with that, sh shall we call it time? Next time, I think we'll be back um, looking at another issue of the magazine. Jasper, what will we be talking about? Uh, we'll be talking about issue thirteen one, and um, there might be some characters coming by that have been mentioned more than once today. Uh, one specifically. So, what what's the theme? Uh, it's about uh, Epirus and Tarentum in uh, uh, the late 4th and early 3rd century BC. So don't forget to subscribe to the magazine if you want to be all over the topic next time we record. So thank you, Jasper, Murray, Lindsay, Mike and Mark. I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.